operational part of the uh, uh, in the beginning. And uh, now we will uh, start with the uh, real work. So the uh, idea is that I will give you a very quick introduction on what Atlas is. Um, all the topics uh, uh, covering the technical details of, of Atlas, uh, what are Atlas services, service templates, <clears throat> have been covered in the previous webinar. So we uh, won't go into a lot of detail here. Uh, but as I said at the beginning, if you have a specific questions on one of these things, uh, feel free to ask them. We can uh, hopefully answer all your, your questions. So I will then share my screen now and I think it is it is visible now. And uh, so I can uh, start with the presentation. So Atlas. Atlas is the acronym uh, for Agricultural Interoperability and Analysis System. And uh, yeah, we are uh, Horizon 2020 research project, which is uh, running since 2019. And we are shortly before uh, finishing the project, which will happen end of July this year. And uh, yeah, we have been working on digital farming solutions. And uh, uh, what you see here is for sure not uh, new for you. Um, Farming involves a lot of digital systems, and uh, yeah, the pain point uh, with a lot of these systems uh, which exist on the market and which uh, uh, where farmers also have a, a very good reason to choose a, a specific piece of software or a set of different uh, software systems or digital systems. The, the, one of uh, the main issues here is data interoperability, how to get data from one system to another system. And uh, what we have been developing in Atlas is uh, nothing less than a solution to this problem. And uh, we approach uh, this, uh, uh, this challenge uh, using a service-oriented architecture. So we enable data exchange through standardized services. And these services can be arranged in a decentralized network of such services with trusted and autonomous participants. This means uh, Atlas is, is not a, a data platform or a, a data silo or a central data hub. Where, where data is flowing through um, or where, where all the services are hosted. Um, or Atlas is completely decentralized with a minimum of centralized components. And, and one of these components you will get to know in detail today. Um, but Atlas is completely decentralized. Atlas participants are companies uh, providing software systems, and they are completely responsible for uh, hosting these systems and doing the, the data uh, uh, management of these <coughs> systems. So um, the data transport in, in Atlas is always peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, Atlas provides the infrastructure to interconnect uh, different software systems on behalf of a, a end user of these software systems. Atlas is furthermore a uh, open interoperability network. So um, every uh, participant uh, registering at Atlas, providing Atlas uh, compliant software, can participate in Atlas. Um, how Atlas works from a very high level point of view is that we have, uh, in the end, the yeah, Atlas participants, companies providing digital systems, uh, digital agricultural systems. And these uh, participants uh, can either be uh, providers of Atlas uh, services or consumers of Atlas services. These participants have then end users, uh, which have uh, usually accounts 
on, on these systems and which then can interconnect uh, different systems from different uh, Atlas participants. The central components uh, which are uh, shown here are the service registry or the Atlas registry. This is a very, very important part of the infrastructure. Here, all the services uh, are uh, listed and with these services, the information on how to interconnect these services on a technical level. We furthermore have a, uh, uh, a component which we call participant portal. This is the main interaction point uh, of, uh, for all Atlas participants. These are the participant portal. Uh, provides in the end a user interface where you could uh, register your Atlas compliant services, where you could register your company, that all the information uh, needed to interconnect uh, different systems is available. Um, it is uh, crucial to understand that service registry participant portal, uh, this is accessed by Atlas participants, meaning this is done by companies, by software providers, by IT experts. So the end user, the farmer, will never get in contact to the service registry or to the participant portal. So um, what you get with this system is uh, you can interconnect uh, different existing software systems. We can retrofit uh, your existing software in a relatively simple manner to make it interoperable. And uh, with this interoperability, you add a lot of uh, flexibility for your end users, for farmers. So the farmers can choose which combination of different software systems uh, he or she uh, wants to use on, on the farm, depending on the very specific needs. Um, and this uh, also um, uh, accelerates innovation uh, through this flexibility and openness. Because as a small software provider, you can focus on your very specific solution, on your very uh, specific know-how without having to, to build, for example, a full-fledged farm management system around your solution just to allow your, your, your customer, your end user uh, to work with your software. And uh, with the technology we have been developing Atlas, you can uh, construct quite complex end-to-end uh, data and operation flows uh, by setting up the interconnections between a multitude of different systems. How this will be done uh, in detail uh, by the example of uh, getting uh, data from Atlas to a machine and data back will be shown now in this webinar. So what you have with Atlas is, that's the, the takeaway messages, uh, decentralized service oriented interconnection of machines, sensors, data services, and all that uh, uh, helps to improve interoperability of digital solutions and in the end, the digitalization of farming. And uh, we have already uh, created a lot of technology and information you could use. We have our public GitHub repositories uh, where you can find all the relevant things. Uh, we also have the participant portal, which is uh, ready to be used um, by interested companies. If you need more information, if you need uh, uh, want to know more details about this, feel free to approach me during the meeting, after the meeting. Uh, I would leave it for now as this and then hand over to, the, uh, to my colleague Marco. And uh, then we can uh, now really go into the technical details and the demonstration of uh, uh, today's topic, the Atlas Equipment Center. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction, uh, Stefan. Uh, I will share my screen. Let me know if you see it well. It should be there. All right. Yes. So, uh, Again, let me reintroduce myself. I'm Marco Caballero, the CTO of AgriCircle, uh, but also the lead architect in the design of the Atlas Interoperability Network. So, um, the Atlas Equipment Center is a part of the Atlas core infrastructure. But unlike the participant portal and the Atlas registry, 
the equipment center is an optional convenience service with one simple goal. And that goal is to make the interfacing with tractors a commodity. So uh, wherever this is part of a requirement of a software solution and so on, uh, you know, anyone who has uh, done, uh, gone through this kind of, uh, uh, through this kind of uh, development has realized that uh, it is a complex undertaking. And so you might have great ideas about new algorithms, better ways to optimize fertilization and to do a number of things. But at one point or the other, if you need to get to be able to send this to interface with specific, uh, with different types of machinery, you realize that, that this implementation alone might be significantly larger than uh, what your USP is. So we want to remove that because at the end of the day, this shouldn't be uh, a complex undertaking, a time-consuming undertaking for, uh, for solution providers. It should be something that's just available. And uh, so that's what we try to do. So basically in the design goals, uh, it's really about having an API at the end of the day that makes it easy to send tasks in one single universal format. Uh, which is uh, non-proprietary, open, platform independent, and so on, being able to send that uh, via the equipment center, which acts as some sort of gateway or hub, if you like, to the target equipment that uh, is owned by the farmer who needs to carry out a task. And so in these operations, obviously, we want to make sure that we're able to support the leading manufacturers that are out there. Uh, so ISO bus based uh, uh, equipment with ISO XML formats or uh, the well uh, accepted uh, J, uh, shape files that we see also and so on. But we also want to make it easy to for niche manufacturers developing some very specialized equipment. Uh, so uh, which uh, and, and those people very often uh, do not have the resources to actually implement a full ISO bus stack and so on. We will also make see how we make it easy for those people to uh, integrate in the equipment center and be a possible target for a task to be executed on, the, on an equipment. Of course, with all that, we want to remain modular, extensible. This is not a project uh, that will be frozen in time. The world out there moves quickly enough. And so the design is really there to make it easy to add on modules and support for different kind of uh, equipment and formats that uh, that are out there. Oops. Right. Whoops. All right. So I'll not spend a lot of time here. This is just a, a little under the hood view of the equipment center. We have a management and configuration interface at some point. The user, the, the equipment center, I mean, sorry, farmers will have an account in the equipment center where they manage their equipment to which they can send tasks to be executed on fields. So through this management and configuration interface, which we will see, they're able to configure the available equipment and also to interact with some operations that require manual uh, interactions. Then we have the API part. So this is the API for the what, what we call an Atlas, the Atlas enabled digital information system. You can think of uh, an FMIS being a, an example of an ADIS. So uh, such a system would provide the front end basically to uh, the, the visible front end to which the end user would, you know, uh, plan his tasks, uh, prepare his tasks, plan them, and eventually send them through this API uh, to the equipment for execution. We then have a variety of different uh, modules uh, at the moment. I mean, this, this is really extensible for converting uh, these uh, tasks in our universal format to the required target format of uh, that the tractor can accept. So that will depend on the vendors. It's often going to be, as, as I mentioned, ISO XML. It might also be uh, in the shapefile format, whatever it takes. Uh, these are modules that are responsible for 
doing this conversion, but also for handling the connectivity to the tractor. And there are different solutions out there amongst the leading vendors. So we have John Deere with a specific API that allows us to do that. AgriRouter also through which we can uh, send uh, ISO XML task sets to, uh, to equipment uh, and so on. To that, we add uh, things which are a little bit more Atlas specific here. So on one side, the App Engine API. So we will see if we have time at the end of this session for, for Stefan to tell us a, a few words about the App Engine. But let's say it's a specific, um, uh, pla it's a platform that we have uh, conceptualized in Atlas uh, to, to be able to also manage tasks on, uh, on a tractor. Whether, whether I don't want to get into too much details there, but let's just say it exists. And uh, if anyone is interested, we'll cover it. And then we have what we call this cloud to cloud API. So this is really the module that we use to provide a more universal access. It means any equipment manufacturer, usually niche equipment manufacturer who wishes to expose, to make his equipment available within the Atlas Equipment Center, can implement this API and from and through that make his tractors, his equipment visible to the Atlas Equipment Center. And so and this API gives him the means afterwards on his own site to convert our universal format to whatever his uh, low level native format is. So let's say there's a slight conceptual difference from the equipment server uh, gateway with the leading vendors where we do this conversion proactively and we push the information to the target systems. We are here uh, in this API, the information is pulled out from our system and the responsibility of the conversion, since they are usually smaller players, lies with the manufacturer platform uh, himself. We'll see also in some examples how the equipment center, so what the equipment center ultimately manages equipment and tasks or task sets, if we like. So what do I want to do with which uh, equipment or tractor? Uh, in order to carry that out, the tasks, they are typically made of their models in Atlas through what we call uh, an advice which acts on a field. And there we use the equipment center itself connects to these Atlas component, the field data service, for instance, which is the farmer's, uh, the farmer's uh, source of truth, if you like, for his field. So where he's going to manage his fields and any other software who needs information about a field, uh, such as the boundaries, but uh, also what's been done in the field and so on. Uh, has this information of field data service. So the equipment center is able to access this information, but also to update this information with the results of tasks that have been performed uh, when they're done by, by the tractors. Again, this will become clearer when we go through, uh, through a demonstration, but so fundamentally we act as a hub to the machines and then it records the results of the executed tasks on the field data service, making it available to any other Atlas service that the farmer has allowed to, act, to access his field data service. Moving on, we will do a short demo. So actually, I already have it open here. So this is, uh, this is the equipment center. So you have to remember that this is not, this is what I would call an advanced proof of concept. We don't claim that it is by any means uh, a finished product, but we have implemented quite a lot of functionality in it uh, to make sure that all the basic concepts we had in mind uh, make sense and, uh, and function well in real life. And so, uh, it, it is usable. It has been used by uh, many of the partners of the, uh, of the consortium, but also by a number of open call participants, open call winners uh, who have implemented solutions that, it, that interact directly with the equipment center. So we see in this farmer view, 
there are basically uh, two important areas uh, that, uh, that we have here, which are the tasks that are currently there. So this is more like a sort of, typically a sort of monitoring to see what is going on at any point of time. Uh, and so here uh, I, I can see a, a simplified view of, uh, of these tasks and, uh, and get into additional details to see, okay, this particular task is, uh, um, is actually a task set that has two tasks on it, uh, and it will basically uh, fertilize with cow slurry and then with uh, do a P, uh, phosphorus fertilization with some other product. All right, and we can see at which stage it is. So pending, it means it's, it hasn't completed yet, completed, and so on and so forth. The other important part, this is where the farmer will typically configure the tractors that, uh, that he owns. Uh, and so we have, we can see we have a number of uh, tractors in this uh, example account, in this demo account. But so typically the configuration means, all right, what is the platform? So a common platform would be equipment gateway through which I would say, for instance, uh, this, I want to use the John Deere connector or the agri router connector. Uh, if, and once I select this, I will actually link my equipment to, uh, in this particular case, a John Deere tractor that was pulled through the API. So whenever I send this, it will simply automate the connection of uh, things to be sent from my equipment center to this target tractor that does exist in my John Deere account on my operation center. Similarly, if you look with AgriRouter, you would then see the, uh, the equipment that are configured in your AgriRouter environment. So this is just a demo environment. I don't have real tractors. I just have the, the simulator, but I would be able to simply create the equipment center representation of something that exists in AgriRouter or in uh, my John Deere operation center in this case. Uh, we have the uh, the app engine options, which I mentioned. So here it's just uh, an identifier that we enter again, not too much time. I'll speak later, uh, but we also have uh, this is the other equipment, uh, the other equipment. So here, for instance, this allows me to define uh, a keyword that represents an external cloud to cloud uh, solution. So I could say, uh, you know, Optronics, this is one of our open call winner. Uh, and basically that identifies the correct connector through which they can interface with the equipment center. At the moment, I have to enter it by hand. The, the user interface is not completely polished here. Uh, I also have the option through the other to simply say, well, this is actually uh, a fairly, uh, you know, not a very modern tractor. It doesn't have any of the fancy, uh, uh, variable rate controllers that uh, other tractors might have, no connection, uh, no live connection and so on. But I still want to be able to uh, send some basic uh, uh, operations to these tractors and get them back. We'll see again how that works with a specific example a little bit later. So having configured my, my equipment, so we can see here have different examples, uh, I can I can also, by the way, I didn't mention that in the equipment itself, but uh, I can also have the option when I don't have an over the air connectivity to my tractor, such as agri router the, uh, and so on. I also have the option of saying this tractor actually supports uh, a USB uh, and I can select whether it's going to be the ISO XML format or the shapefile format for the, uh, for the export. And for those tractors, in the equipment center, I will be able to manually download a uh, task set, stick it on a USB stick, load it in the tractor, and when the when I'm done on the tractor, get the uh, the logs back and upload them to the system so that they can be parsed and converted to the Atlas format. So with that, we, we cover uh, all those uh, variations. Uh, these API keys are uh, specific configurations that pertain to the uh, to the app engine. I'm going to skip that and the pairing again. If you followed the previous uh, uh, webinar, uh, you'll remember that in order to access other services, so I mentioned that the equipment center needs to have access to the field data, for instance, and for other operations to the different uh, types of advisors. 
he needs to be given the permission to access this farmer data by establishing a parent. So this is done here. You can see what are the parents that are already established uh, for this particular farmer. You can revoke it and you can, when a new pairing request comes, you can accept a new pair. But so this is how the equipment center will be able to directly communicate with other third party services without any human intervention, copying of files manually or, or whichever, using the existing services and service templates that are defined in Atlas. Now, quickly back to the present, back to to this. Uh, we'll now look at uh, at a concrete example. So we we looked at the components uh, now, but it's going to be more interesting when we see this at play in a more real life scenario. So the example we're going to uh, to illustrate uh, with the help of Stefan uh, and his team here is that uh, what we call the advisor pattern. So basically, from my uh, FMIS, I plan, uh, let's say a fertilization operation. So I will interact, I mean, first I will interact with a field data service so I can see what are the fields that are available, maybe represent them in a nice way on a map or something, then select uh, some of those fields and choose what kind of uh, operation do I want to plan on it. Uh, so for instance, I will plan a fertilization operation. So I'll talk to, uh, I'll, I'll use my fertilization advisor from that. And when the advice is ready, I will be able to submit a task set to the equipment center after having, to, you know, in which I have selected also, by the way, the equipment to which I want to send it to. And that will then, that task will then arrive in the equipment center where it will either be processed transparently and automatically if we have one of those systems with. Uh, over the air communication and so on, or where the farmer will simply be able to download uh, maybe uh, to a USB stick, uh, if that's uh, the only connectivity he has, the resulting uh, task set to be, uh, to be uploaded to his tractor. So I suggest you take the control back, Stefan, to, to show that to us and give us a yes. few words about the basic FMIS. Yes, so I'm going to share my screen now. I think you can see it. So what we have here is, we call it basic FMIS yeah, because it is very basic. Uh, it's uh, more or less a, a test system we have been developing uh, within the last uh, years to uh, showcase all these uh, <clears throat> different concepts uh, we uh, have in Atlas, uh, we have ready in, in Atlas. So what we are going to do here is um, to plan a fertilization task for a specific field we have on a specific farm and uh, send that task to the equipment center. And uh, as Marco already uh, explained, uh, the, the basic philosophy behind Atlas is you have different services from different uh, providers and you can pair them with uh, a software system which implements clients to such services. Uh, what we have here, for example, is what you see, uh, we are paired to a field data service, which is a digital field twin and a fertilization advisor service, which will then do the fertilization uh, or calculate the uh, uh, fertilization map for a selected field. Um, what we also need to do is in order to make that work, uh, we need to pair with the equipment center in order to access all our equipment. And I can do that in that view by just uh, click on the pairing. So now I have uh, I'm redirected to the actual login page of the equipment center. Um, I will then uh, use my my demo account I have on that system uh, in order to log in. And uh, what that 
hasn't been successful. Hopefully a typo. Okay, Marco, help me what I'm doing wrong. Give me a second. Ah, okay, okay, I see. So, yeah, you see, we are live. And what you also see is, uh, the system is secure if you have the wrong uh, username or password, it doesn't work. Now we have it, and now I'm redirected, uh, and now I'm paired to the equipment center. So if you see, that is now green. Um, you also see why it's called basic FMIS. Uh, it is, of course, a, a, a test system with uh, no uh, uh, <clears throat> full full functional uh, user interface, but it will do the trick for, for today. So now I'm, I'm paired to the equipment center, and uh, maybe, Malku, you could tell me if I should go here and show what we have there, if that's, I think that will work. Yeah, yeah, you can do that quickly. So. Uh, you will see the same account yeah. that I showed before. This is simply it's a good. different user to the same account. Yeah. So. so now I'm logged in. It got the, the, the session cookie from the browser window, so I'm now here. And uh, yeah, what you see here is the, the, the equipment I have. And it's good that you show it because you will see the same list then in the other system. So because these systems are now connected uh, and paired. Uh, by the way, the, 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 the protocol behind that, so that that works, I can access uh, this data from this system uh, that is all done via OAuth 2. And yeah, here you see all the, the, the tractors I have. Uh, I only have them on the demo account uh, and not in real life. So, but now let's start with with a planning uh, of a of a fertilization advice. So I select uh, a field. So we are traveling to to Switzerland now um, because we have set up a field there where we have all the necessary information there for the fertilization advisor to prefer such a fertilization task. And uh, I can do now a, a, a standard N application. I can select my, my fertilizer. Um, let's take that one, uh, doesn't matter for the demo. And then I can prepare, prepare that advice uh, if it's maybe I select a different one that one worked so now the advice has been uh, created and uh, in form of for a task file so this is uh, I think Matthew already explained what the, the, the task set is in the task file so I can add this advice now to the task set and uh, then send it to the equipment center by creating such a task set in the equipment center. I'm doing this and then I can choose my equipment. I think it's visible now and you see it's the same list we have here in the in the AgriCircle system. Uh, all my equipment can be queried using the API and I have it here. And then uh, I can select uh, that machine I have. Um, and then I can uh, add also a description of the task that I later know what it's about here. Um, I call it that here. And then I submit the task set. Then it's gone here, and now it's in the equipment center. And then I can go here, see all my tasks, and then that task is now being processed by the equipment center. So currently it's pending, and I have to 
refresh it from time to time, and then I see when it's done. What's what's going on there behind the scenes is, uh, and it it happens only at uh, you know on frequent intervals. It's not meant to be real time here. But what's happening is the conversion of that task, which is in our standard Atlas format, to uh, in this case uh, it's uh, it's probably uh, an ISO XML format uh, for or maybe a. Oh, let's see. We'll we'll discover uh, into this uh, format that's required by this particular tractor. And when it's ready, uh, since this tractor has no over-the-air capability, we'll be able to download that task to uh, to a file which we can put on a USB stick. And that conversion is now ready. Um, and uh, maybe I'll show it on. Exactly. So you can take over now because now it's because uh, that tractor is connected via a USB stick, uh, which means you have to download it and put it uh, on the USB stick and then on your tractor. So if you want to take over, Mac. Yeah, I will. Let's talk to sharing. Go back to the equipment center. So again, I use a different user ID, but the the account, the organization, is the same. I mean, that's just the feature of uh, of the equipment center. You don't have a single user per account. If it's a larger farm, you can have different users who have different logins, but who see the same data at the end of the day. So I that is why under my demo at agricircle.com, I see the same data as uh, Stefan. It's not like every user would see that. Uh, we are just sharing one account. So we, we have this file. At this point, we can uh, we can actually download this. We can have a quick look at it to, to, to see what's going on here. Uh, what is this file? Well, it's actually a task data. It's an ISO XML. So we could, to be honest, I'm not going to go in a lot more detail, but uh, you can actually take this, put it on a USB stick, uh, or there are even some editors where you could verify that the data there is really in the required format for this particular tractor, given the confirmation, the configuration we established in the equipment center. So uh, that, I guess, that closes. So this is what we would upload. You would put it in your tractor, and as I said, getting the uh, resulting logs from the tractor upon completion of the operation of the field. And you would then be, if you had it available, be able to upload it here, selecting, it's not the same file, I can't take the same one, but selecting this results file from your tractor, uploading it to your system so that it gets processed uh, by the equipment center. I will, sh so that, that's the idea. Uh, here, this is a fairly manual process. If uh, the file had been sent to an app engine, this would have been completely automated uh, after a short while on the cabin of the tractor, which has this app engine, you would have seen the new tax task set appear and you would have been able to pick it up to, to be able to start working on it. So, so it's all configured via uh, the capabilities of the equipment that maps the real tractor behind the scenes. So I would say, are there any questions up to this point uh, already? Uh, would anyone like to have some <coughs> clarification before we move on to to more to a more technical part of the presentation? So I can I can answer that question. Uh, yes, there are. Um, we have two questions in the chat. I, I start with the simplest one. Will this video be accessible online? Yes, it will. Um, and then the second question is, do you have a standardized list of fertilizers? Where is the list kept up to date? Same goes for plant protection, uh, etc. So uh, the answer to here is uh, this list of fertilizers, which is uh, used for the fertilization advisor service that comes from the farm management information system. Uh, in our case, we have uh, a manual uh, um, a manual managed database where we have a, a list of fertilizers, uh, the names and the, the, the nutrient composition for each fertilizer. So it's uh, there is no standardized list or central service which you connect 
to and uh, uh, read uh, uh, the, the specific fertilizers available. Uh, however, the Atlas concept would allow for the existence of such a service um, so that, that providers of such software systems do not have to maintain such a list manually. But at the moment, we do not have that. And uh, so for this, uh, you would, as a provider of such a uh, farm management system, you would be responsible to uh, uh, maintain such a list and uh, to send the specific ingredients of the fertilizer in this example, so N, P, and K, and other things in the requested format to the fertilization advisor service. So then the next question, is the field data service a requirement for the equipment center to work? Is it mandatory to have a field data service on the system? So the answer is yes, because you will see that any uh, every task is always made up, as I said, by an advice and an equipment. And at least every advice to date is made up, contains a reference to a field. So the target field on which you're going to perform the operation. So what the equipment center receives uh, is ultimately a reference to the field, is what we call the field URN. We'll, uh, we'll go in those details. So we don't copy all the data of the field in every request and so on. The equipment center just receives a reference and it needs to have an access to the farmer's field data to be able to resolve the information it needs from that reference. So the boundaries, uh, I mean, it's mainly the boundaries today. It could be other type of information. Also, it will need the field data service pairing to be able to record the as applied information that is received at the end of the uh, operation of the on field operation. And so for both these reasons on input and for recording the results, it requires the presence of a field data service. So, and the next question, is the equipment center going to be available as a container or in any other form so we could use it as a component? So the, the idea of, with Atlas is we, we try to make it actually easier for you by saying we run it for you. So all you need is for your farmers to have an account on it and you to be an Atlas participant. And then it's simply and it behaves exactly as any other Atlas service. So over an API, over a REST API, uh, talking to the existing implementation. The, the goal in Atlas would be uh, ultimately, I don't, uh, at least that's the current idea, is to make such a service free, uh, free of use. I mean, it's not the point for Atlas necessarily to make money out of an equipment center other than for maybe just, you know, uh, financing the basic operations, but no more. So, no, it's not provided as a, as a container or source code, but it's provided as a web service that you can connect to for many of your applications. Then the other question, we saw getting data from a service to the tractor. Is something similar possible also for downloading from the tractor? Yes, exactly. So it's just, uh, I don't have ready-made data to show it, but this is what I showed before. Uh, in, the, in the USB format, it would simply mean that you would export the, the relevant file, typically log files from the tractor to USB stick, and those files you could then upload to the equipment uh, center so that they are processed, converted in our uh, more generic format, and then recorded on the field data server. Similarly, if you were using, uh, you know, the, the John Deere connectivity or agri-router mm -hmm. and the tractors had the capability of sending these files back via that, they would be processed automatically in that case uh, and uh, with the results being stored on the field data. Cool. So, and then we have we have a, a comment by uh, David. Um, so in, in Spain, 
there will be soon a, a, such a, a public available uh, list of fertilizers, probably also crop protection, uh, which then could be uh, used for this. So this is very interesting. Um, if you want, you can also say a few words here in, uh, to announce this. Uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, just uh, drop me a message afterwards. But I think you are, uh, you can say something here. Uh, yes, a clarification. I don't know if you are aware that in Spain there is a digital field book it will be mandatory. So there will there are lots of uh, standardized um, attributes that a farmer should uh, record for every parcel and including the fertilizers. Uh, there will be a, an API to, to do the nutrient, nutrient budgeting and an API for the, for the list of fertilizers. And of course, there is already an API, it's not an API, but there is an official list of uh, plant protection products because those products are very, very well. And there's a lot of regulation about them. So that, that list is what already exists and we will implement new lists for that. Excellent. Now, in, in fact, it's 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 a very good point. I mean, we, we've thought uh, quite a while whether we should include something like this in Atlas. It's just to date, uh, you know, there are solutions, they exist list in different countries. They're rarely the same. Uh, so they're already very country dependent. Uh, and so trying to create something Europe-wide, a single database, it's not just creating it, but maintaining it as well. So we didn't think this should be at least not today a central component, but we could easily imagine uh, if there are different providers of such, li such lists to make a kind of service, a standardized so an Atlas service template that can be implemented in different countries by different companies uh, so that you know any FMIS could benefit from it. And if you, for instance, uh, would be uh, interested in something like this, we could discuss of defining a, a very simple service template format so that we have a unified API to get that information from whoever implements it. That's the benefit at the, at the end of the day is that uh, if I write, if I sell an FMIS in different European countries, it would be better if I didn't have to implement a different API for every different product provider, but I had one API, the Atlas API, which, uh, which doesn't take much work on the provider part to just say you make a small adapter. That means you can provide the same information maybe in your native format if you have existing customers, but also in the Atlas format to be agreed on. It would be a great thing if you were interested to to discuss to to set up, because we are just missing the the opportunity to to do that uh, today. Yeah, I think definitely there is lots of room there to work on it. Yeah. Because even mm -hmm. even within Spain, we are trying to standardize among different mm -hmm. regions, and the next step, of course, is Europe. And I've seen that the the list of products is very heterogeneous among different yeah. countries, and it's a mess. It's a complete mess. They are, they are exactly. complete right. There was a, a conclusion too, <laughs> but uh, again, uh, at the same time, it would be a great service to uh, mm -hmm. to anyone implementing FMIS is not to have to build their own database, but let's say to avoid that problem in Atlas, uh, let's say at the lower level of Atlas, as Stefan mentioned, we never work with product references, we work with product components. So that's how we bypass the problem for the moment. So. Uh, when you request that advice for uh, a particular uh, a particular type of fertilization, uh, basically uh, in the basic FMIS, there's a list of products. It's going to send the name as a description, but it's going to send in a well-specified format the actual nutrients that are contained in that product if it's a fertilizer, and those will be recorded on the field data service. So it means that they can be processed down the line if you're calculating emissions or anything. Even if you don't know the product, you will always see the actual components that are in there. And so with that, let's say at the low level, at the technical level, <laughs> we are agnostic of any country regulation. Good, so uh, it would be it would be great if you... Uh... Leave your contact data, drop us a message, and then we can, if you want, uh, discuss that in more more detail after the, the meeting. 
Good. So I, I can move on with another question if uh, this is now clarified. So question is, would it be possible to have multiple farmer accounts linked to a single vehicle? Mm, today, no. Uh, the question would be, I would turn the question and say, why would you want that? Are you talking about some sort of shared vehicles? Is it a contractor model you're looking at? Uh, what is it? How do you envision that? So maybe, uh, Ed, you could uh, actually comment on this directly. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Uh, thanks. <laughs> Sorry, I got <laughs> I got stuck on mute. Uh, usual problem. Uh, yes, thanks. So I'll give you a, a use case scenario. Uh, we're doing a project in Kenya at the moment uh, with about 1,200 farmers, which starts next year. Obviously, um, the use case would uh, is to work with a farmer cooperative, and they don't own machines. Uh, they don't have machinery. Most of the field work is unmechanized at the moment but they want to move to a mechanized service uh, model and uh, we're looking at providing the vehicle fleet so each vehicle that we have that we're designing uh, has its own identity each farmer has an account and the nature of their farms are they're all, nearly all under five hectares in size um, so the idea is that they're, they're never going to actually own a farm they're never going to have a tractor that they can own themselves so the idea is that the community would share uh agricultural services and obviously the vehicles that provide those agricultural services uh, what we're interested in is looking at field boundary data so as we move from one farmer say they have a field of barley it's not a, not a typical crop out there but let's just use that as an example uh and we move from the field boundary a for farmer a to field boundary b for farmer b uh, we want to stop charging farmer a and start charging farmer B. Uh, so the activities would be, uh, if you like, we'd, we'd swap the we'd swap uh, the charging mechanism on the fly. So the, the for although the for all the farmers are registered, uh, they're sharing a vehicle, um, and then ultimately uh, they get they get billed for the 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 utilization of that vehicle for that particular activity on that particular day, uh, without us having to unhitch. Uh, decouple the vehicle from the from the implement, uh, so everything can be done on the fly. So that's really why we're interested in that mm -hmm. particular scenario. I hope so that ju just yeah. Yeah. one quick clarification. In your model, do you envision that? I mean, would the farmer basically, uh, you know, use the vehicle himself, and you want to bill him for his field, or would the operation be carried out by some employee of the cooperative or something on behalf of the farmer? The vehicle is autonomous uh, and it's not owned by the cooperative. They use it on a per use basis. They pay for it on a per use oh, okay. basis. And as long as the farmer is a member of that cooperative, they can call up the use of that vehicle. The idea is to optimize the operations nice. to, to get farmers to actually plant pretty much at the same time so that we, we go from a hundred five acre farms to effectively having five farm, uh, five vehicles that can manage a thousand farmers that's really where we want to, to go to so i then i will ask you to maybe you know maybe we we resume this discussion when i get to uh to the final part of the presentation we'll be uh showing the the contractor model that we have in mind uh and uh maybe you'll see if if it seems to me that could map exactly what you're talking about great okay look forward to that i'll i'll, I'll stay i'll stay zoomed in thanks very much <laughs> So then uh, I'm going just uh, through the messages now. Um, is the developed internal format defined, reusable, and maybe source code available to go on from there? The answer is almost uh, yes to everything. So the, the internal format, let's say the, the format of uh, the advice, which is the essential part here, is uh, geo package. So open standard, uh, you'll find tons of references on the web, different tools to uh, and software libraries to generate them, to uh, to view them, 
uh, and so on. I will give you a quick example afterwards of, uh, of what it looks like as well. But so it's geopackage with uh, a set of conventions that we add on top of it because geopackage is, is too flexible, I would almost say. Uh, so, and uh, those conventions are all defined. So for each type of operation, fertilization, crop protection, uh, even irrigation uh, and so on, it's all defined on our GitHub uh, on the, uh, in the field data service. Actually, uh, you will see it defined because all those information, I mean, in the field data service and in the relevant advisors. Again, maybe at the end of the session, I'll, I'll do a quick jump there to, uh, to give you the pointer of where to look at. Uh, you should find all the information you need. But again, uh, wherever we can, we embrace existing open standards. Uh, and so that's definitely what we've done here uh, using GeoPackage, which is, uh, uh, let's say, very similar in many ways to, to shapefiles, just uh, more modern and with some added flexibility in the sense that it handles both uh, raster and, uh, and vector modes, uh, which is pretty nice. Good. And then we have uh, one question for, for David about uh, the framework in Spain. Is it a governmental effort to provide the framework you have been describing? You, you are muted. Now, can you hear me? Yes. OK, there was a headphones. Uh, yes, the, regarding the fertilizers, uh, uh, the, yeah, we, I, I work an, at um, let's say a regional research entity, and we will provide that API for all over the region in a in an agreement with the National Ministry of Agriculture. In the framework of that digital field book of Spain, there are lots of uh, um, I think lots of uh, standard. It's been a big long process of standardizing the list of crops, the list of fertilizers, the list of uh, many other things, pests. Uh, uh, herbs, so all kind of the things you can imagine are being standardized, let's say, so that all the FMIS, uh, private and public FMIS, can connect and share the information in the, and send the data to the government. So there is an endpoint for the government, an API, where the, every the FM, FMIS will have to send the data following a more or less strict uh, nomenclature. And we are working in that big project, let's say, with the fertilizer. We provide a nutrition advice and the fertilizer list and and we as well have an FMIS, a public free FMIS for the farmers. So we are also, we have different roles in that project. I don't know if I, it's clear. But mm -hmm. Something very new, eh? so to be honest, it's, it's something to, it's going to enter into, in theory, the 1st of September of this year. We will see. Cool. Thanks. And I think there are no new questions here, so we are converging. Um, so then, probably, Marco, you could continue. All right. So I, I will. Sorry, let me. I will continue. So this uh, now is going to be a short part of the session, which is going to be geared more to. Um, to software developers, just to give you a, a better feel about uh, how we achieved what we saw in uh, Stefan's example with the basic FMIS, uh, how we achieve it under the hood and to say, uh, to see how, how little it takes. Again, uh, I'm making a few assumptions uh, about the fact that you already know about the service registry uh, and so on. So I won't go into a lot of details about that. If for those of you who uh, who will follow to that detail if you're interested. Again, uh, there will be references to uh, the, the GitHub projects about it. Uh, but so without further delay, let me move to, uh, uh, to a software environment. So these, this is a tool simply to manage to, to you know, test API calls to the different systems. So from the first perspective, as I mentioned, the Atlas Equipment Center is not a real, it's not truly an Atlas service because there's no 
equipment center service template per se. But let's say, but for commodity, for convenience reasons, uh, you can still uh, query some information and manage the pairing to the equipment center via the Atlas registry, like any other service. So for instance, uh, this is an Atlas registry call. It's I already have my tokens configured and so on. And if you can see here, the service name that I have by default is equipment center. So I can, for instance, query the service registry to say what's the API URL of, of course, I'm not connected just when I need to. So I will do this uh, quickly without explaining what I'm doing, if you don't mind, because I want to do that. Ah. Okay, so this could be enough. And now, it's always when you want to, I did this a few times this morning, and of course now, ah, that's probably the one I need. Okay, so here should be fine. So here we go. So this is a call to the Atlas registry to say, please give me, it's one of the uh, registry APIs, give me the base URL of the equipment center and we can see, okay, I get the URL to the configuration UI. This is what we've been showing, uh, but I also get the URL for the API calls. Uh, it's almost the same, but it's got API in here, right? Uh, similarly, I can say, give me the pairing information for this uh, for this service, and I will receive the OAuth two auth and token URL, uh, just like for any service, which I can use to obtain an access token to make API request to the registry. So, this is just to show you, uh, it's it's very it, it's literally the same mechanism than to pair to any other Atlas service. It's just got this re reserved name and it's the only one of its kind, which is Equipment Center. So, having got that, I have a ready-made token already. And now I will show you, for instance, here we have the API to list the equipment available on that service. And you should see that, okay, in a technical format, uh, we find the same kind of tractor if you had them in mind from before, that we saw in the user interface or in the basic FMIS. This is basically how the basic FMIS obtained the list of tractors to show when he was sending the task set uh, to, uh, to show in this drop down menu. So, a simple API call, and you get the list of, API of tractors and some information about their type, which the important thing, what's, what will be needed for the API call, is the actual low level ID. All right. Uh, I can also request the details for one of those equipment, but again, it doesn't give me a lot more information. Uh, here, here it is. Now, so I'm writing my own FMIS. I manage the pairing to the equipment center the way the basic FMIS did. And so when I have prepared a task, I want to connect to it. I just first start by listing the equipment. I should not save this in a database once and for all, because clearly, uh, if if I create a new equipment, I want to be able to see it here. So it should be a, a live API call in this particular case. Uh, similarly, then the next step is to say, well, I want to send a task to the equipment center. So uh, I first need to prepare a task. Uh, I'm, I'm quickly going to do that. You can see in all my APIs, I also have an API to my to the field data service that's being used there. I can list the fields that are available and I'm actually going to work with this field here. This is the same field Ambach that, um, that Stefan used in his example. So I have a field. Uh, it's actually, I have a script that puts it automatically in a variable. So I have a field and now I will prepare an advice. So let's prepare a nitrogen fertilization advice. You can see here to prepare that. The parameters to prepare an advice are the reference to the field. So this field URN, if I hover on it, you should see. Well, actually, you can't see it in hovering. But anyway, it's that field that I mentioned. You have the nutrients that I'm using, could have been P2O5, K2O, uh, and so on. Uh, I mean, this is the nutrients. No, sorry. These are the nutrients for which I want to fertilize. And then 
this is the product uh, details that I'm sending. So I'm saying I'm sending a product whose name I name arbitrarily SSA here. This is really just a description. What's important is that I'm saying there are 210 milligrams per kilo of nitrogen in this product. Right, that's what I, that's what we mentioned before by saying we don't send a product reference. We send the technical details of the products that are relevant uh, at the end of the day. Of course, if we could get that from an external database, so much the better. But so essentially, I don't want to get in too much detail. It's not the scope of this, but I I will prepare here an advice. So the result is the advice is uh, is in preparation phase. Uh, you know, some advices are prepared in uh, in under a second. Others, different algorithms from different vendors could require potentially, uh, uh, you know, hours or days uh, if you need to uh, to do some on-field scouting before doing things and so on. So here it's quick. I got a ready advice uh, and I have this advice is identified by a specific advice URN, right? So having an advice, I can now prepare a prepare and send a task. So here, this is now the equipment center API. I'm sending, I'm giving here a name. Uh, so uh, Ambach and I'm giving it a description. This is the same field on a technical level than what uh, than what Stefan was uh, populating through his basic FMS UI. I say the equipment ID I want to use. So this is a variable. Uh, and let's see which equipment ID actually I want to select a specific one. So let me see my equipment again. In this case, I want to use this tractor, which I call the basic fertilizer. So I will just quickly put this into my equipment ID variable name. Sorry for those of you who are not developers, not used to this tool. The important thing is you get the sense at the high level about what it takes. So. I have selected my equipment. I have named my task set. I have a reference to the URN that I have prepared. And now, and you see that for, for those who are more technical, this is an array. So I could have many tasks uh, here. I'm just choosing to make a one task task set. And I'm now sending that to the equipment center. And so here I have the status. It's arrived, it's been accepted. And so if now I go to the equipment center. So, I mean, I could actually also from the equipment center list. Uh, oh no, I don't have this. The task. So, this is not. This is not a feature that exists. So, on the equipment center, I can now uh, view, mm. verify that this task has arrived. I will refresh this here, and we see now I have this task that has arrived. It's been assigned to the tractor that I have. So, this is a tractor. Uh, it's what I mentioned before. I chose this tractor. Mm -hmm. This is what I would call on, uh, you know, uh, a primitive mm -hmm. tractor that doesn't have any capability of doing variable rates or in which I can upload application ah, maps yeah, and yeah, so yeah, on. Yeah, so, but you, ci sentiamo, vediamo se li girano o ti giro io in pratica, eh? vediamo se. Yeah. Could you please mute? Uh, I hear yeah. something Italian. Yeah. You understand it probably. Yeah, I do. All right. So here, for instance, on this oh, tractor, okay. I can, uh, as I said, it's a. This is this doesn't do any conversion to ISO XML because this tractor doesn't have uh, an ISO bus terminal. Uh, you all you may be able to do is manually set the average rate. So it's basically telling me that for this advice, uh, this is the average uh, rate per hectare that you use, or if you prefer, if uh, uh, if it's more convenient, the amount of kilograms per hectare that you should uh, that you should distribute. So this is an information for a human who will then, you know, make sure that he sets up uh, uh, his uh, his default pressure or speed and so on, so that this he gets to get the rate that's recommended to him by the advice. So once he's done that. He can, when he's done, he went on the field, he did what he was supposed to do, and he's going to say, okay, I did it, but I actually chose to do just 65 kilograms per hectare, uh, right? I mean, it's just an advice. Uh, the advice that you should do 71 on average, but he chose to do 65, no problem. In this case, it gets saved. 
And so this in a very simplified fashion is exactly the same process that would happen if instead you had had you know, an agri-router connection to a real tractor who would send the results back, is this data that have been entered has now been recorded on the field data service. So I can see that here, we happen to use in this example, the agri circle field data service, but there are others. Uh, we're not the only one doing it. And I can see, I already have this field configured. I can see that there's something, if you look at the date and the timestamp, it's just now that it was added to it. Uh, so it tells me there was a fertilization application type that has been uh, uh, added to this field. I can see it's, it's, very, uh, it's very raw, but I can see here, uh, this is the amount of product that was put, the nutrients in the product were those, uh, the, and so on and so forth. So here it tells me in terms of kilo, what's the total amount of this product with a concentration of 210 milligram per kilo that was applied on that field. And so any tractor giving us data back on the completion of an operation, whether it's manually, whether it's automated and so on, the equipment center is going to end up parsing that information and recording it on the field data because that information is very important if, um, you know, for, for instance, I may have done a, a slurry fertilization, uh, which is very generic with, uh, with a slurry tanker where it can just have a default rate, but then I want to top off the amount of uh, uh, nitrogen and potassium using a different tractor. Well, the system would be able to say, I know you already, you already applied so much nitrogen on the field, so we are going to take that into account to recommend how much more of mineral nitrogen fertilizer, for instance, you should add. So you can do that kind of things only if you have access to one place where these informations are recorded. And that's why we feel the field data service plays a fundamental role in the system. Okay, but again, I want to repeat for those of you who weren't in the first webinar, there is not one field data in uh, in Atlas, so we we don't say, hey, you must use this one, and all your data will be there. You can implement your your own field data service in your own FMIS, for instance. Ultimately, the choice should be the farmer. The farmer should say, I want to use that field data, meaning that if I uh, create a new field on that field data everyone else who subscribes to this will know about it. I don't need to go and create it everywhere. If anyone wants to know what was performed on a particular of a field of mine, he can, he can find out from the field data service that I elected to, to store my data in, and he doesn't have to pick it up from 20 different places, right? So it should be one per farmer, but, it can be each farmer can have a different one. Use it on his favorite FMIS. If it offers a field data, he can choose to use that, or he can choose to use a third party one. It plays no uh, role in Atlas as long as he has the option to pick one. All right, so I think with that we've shown, and that's, that's basically all the API of the equipment center that you need. So when we talked about making it a commodity, I mean, you know, they're the, the part of preparing an advice and so on, that's not equipment center. That's just to have some data to demo with that I created, right? But uh, ultimately what was relevant is I listed the equipment and I submitted a task set with re reference to some advice that I, that I prepared somewhere else. And that's it, that's the API. And from that, Atlas takes care of taking, by the way, you were, this is maybe where I show you the format in this particular advice uh, that I created. We can, I can download, this is a feature, this is not equipment center, but it's just so you understand. Oh, don't I have it anymore? This again. 
sorry. Uh, I just wanted to, someone asked me, uh, what is the format of an advice of, of this geo package? I can probably give an example here. Let me check if it's ready. It's ready. I can. Okay, uh, I have a configuration issue here, I believe. So, so you see, it's it's all live, meaning all all the systems uh, which are shown, they're actually oh. deployed and in place. And so, there I have it. Uh, so, so there I have it. So here, this is just an example of uh, a quick example of aligning advice that I prepared. You can see that I can actually download it in its original format. This. And what this is, uh, I will just open this part here, which is the most relevant one. So in this particular case, uh, this comes from our own advisor. We generate uh, um, application map recommendation on a, uh, a raster level. I mean, we are we are we are quite precise by saying on these 10 meter by 10 meter, you shall have this amount and so on. Other services might just use uh, zones and so on. That's a choice. So. The format, the geo package file, I'm using here a generic application that some of you may know. It's Q, uh, QGIS, uh, which is you know just a GIS software that uh, can read shape files, uh, uh, but also geo package files, just to show you how standard they are, and uh, and process them. So here is the advice and the results. Yes, applied application map will also come in a geo package format, so you can have the total amounts in a readily easily, but you can also have the detailed information about how much did I fertilize where in the field, uh, depending on uh, that, that would also be available from the field data service. Okay, but again, open format, standard, it's uh, you, you can, Check out there on the web. It's uh, it's not some uh, uh, some side project of uh, of two people down in a garage. It's actually quite widely adopted. Uh, I would say it's the next generation following uh, uh, shape files, but with the flexibility of really uh, it allows us to encode a lot of interesting information in an easy way uh, into uh, into a single file format, which is which has libraries in any language that you want to implement. So, we have this room open until three o'clock. So we are ready for further questions, discussions with exactly. you. I would say if there are questions particularly on the, on the developer side, otherwise I got a couple of more slides to show that I can move to after that. Yeah. And then we can open up to everything. Okay. So as, are there any questions on the on the technical, uh, on the API and so on? Uh, uh, again, all this information, the, the APIs that are being used, they are uh, documented on our GitHub. Uh, so you can find the API specifications. And if you have the credentials, if you register yourself as an Atlas participant, you would be able to access uh, to access these yourself. I just post the link for your convenience to all what we have in Atlas on GitHub here in the chat also, but you will see it also in the in the flight and slides. Yeah, we have it here. So you see, I don't see the chat here. Are there additional yeah, questions? So, or uh, I move? It's a, a question by, by Martin. Could not find uh, in GitHub. Can you share it here? So I've, I've shared the, the link, the two. We have two GitHub repositories, one for uh, what we call the service templates, meaning these are the, the, the standards for the Atlas services. And uh, the other GitHub is uh, where we have sample code, where we have uh, 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 tutorials where we have uh, uh, tools for you to use to uh, connect to Atlas and to implement uh, 
Atlas enabled software system. So both are probably from interest of interest uh, for you. Absolutely. And so this was one of the examples. Again, this is quite technical, but uh, you ask about the file format. So the generic answer is geo package, but then in each for each of the type of advisors that you have, fertilization, crop protection, harvesting, uh, at the moment also irrigation, you will then find the specific conventions that we use within the geo package standards. And so they are documented in each of the relevant service templates. So the, the geo package file contains, as I said, the GIS information, but it also contains metadata uh, about, uh, about the advice in terms of uh, the nutrients, the amounts, uh, and so on and so forth. So I'm not going to get into gory detail about that, but it's all there when you have time to, to have a look at, uh, you can find this information. Similarly, as Stefan said, if you follow the URL to the public GitHub, then you will find among, you know, as I mentioned before, all the information about the service registry, which we covered in a different webinar, but you will also find the Atlas Equipment Center. Uh, and so here we will, among other things, uh, find the API documentation uh, about it. So what I showed, and I didn't want to get too technical too long today, so I showed the API that's relevant from an, let's say, FMIS perspective that wants to send tasks to a tractor, but then you will find there also uh, the APIs that you would use to, uh, to implement a third-party connector. So a connector, maybe uh, if you have your own uh, specific equipment, which is not, uh, you know, specialized equipment, which may not be uh, uh, ISO, uh, ISO bus uh, or anything you could implement, or, or if you're not using, if you can't reach a tractor using uh, uh, Agri Router or John Deere, but some proprietary form of connectivity, you would be able to integrate that using the type of APIs that you find described here. Again, anyone who's interested there, th this is too technical to get at this level. But if there was someone really interested, we could have some, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one session to really go in more details if you have questions whether this would be suitable for your use cases. But you can get a good idea just looking at it about what's possible or not. So, otherwise, let me quickly go over. Uh, I, I promise this information about the uh, the contractor concept. So. Uh, this this is something that we have conceptualized and actually implemented to a certain degree, but not exposed yet uh, to to everyone. So the the idea is quite simple. I mean, with tractors, it happens uh, regularly. Tractors are expensive, uh, as was mentioned by a previous participant, and so uh, many farmers, whether in Africa or even in Europe, uh, don't necessarily own their tractors, but they have uh, they they may uh, request contractors to do uh, operations with maybe uh, expensive precision farming equipment on their behalf, right? So the point is in Atlas, the idea would be, you remember a little bit the equipment center, uh, you would have a way as a farmer to establish a relationship with a contractor. Uh, this is what, let me quickly illustrate this here in the equipment center. If you remember something I jumped over, you can define a tractor of type contractor, all right? And here, the contractor ID, this is very, you need to know information manually here, but this would be the ID of the organization of the contractor. So any user here in the equipment center has its own organization ID. Uh, and so contractors will, would be also equipment center users. They would have their own organization. And so I would create uh, let's say Stefan is my contractor, I would create, I would know he would communicate me his organization ID. I mean, clearly he, he, there would be a nice UI to all this. And I would create in my environment, a one tractor that represents any of Stefan's tractors, basically, right? So, and uh, I would put here the idea. So, uh, uh, 
I, I can't actually even type anything in this environment yet, but so I, I would put the ID that allows me to link that tractor to Stefan's account as my contractor. So anytime I assign any task to this particular tractor in Stefan's account, he would see some notification here to say, hey, I have an external task request, right? So if I click on that, he would then see those are the tasks. So it comes from, uh, you know, from Mac here, he wants to do an end fertilization. And so Stefan would be able to, for instance, I mean, this is an, uh, an idea of the UI to, to oops, sorry, to, to click on this thing to say, I accept it and I assign it to my slurry tanker. Right, so from a generic contractor task, the contractor himself says, that's the tractor I will select to carry out the, the uh, operation on behalf of Matt. So me, I don't know what that tractor is and I don't need to know, but he does, right? And so by doing that, under he has access to only the information that's relevant to this task from my account. So basically the access to the advice, to the field boundaries he has, but only because I've assigned that task to him. He doesn't have a generic access to all my account data, just to the one related to the task that I assigned to him. So in the example that uh, uh, you, you mentioned in Kenya, if I'm not mistaken, I, I was wondering if maybe that's not a model that would work. So you could basically have an account that represents you cooperative and each of the cooperative members basically establishes an, a relation with a cooperative and they basically state what they need to do. I need to harvest this particular field uh, and that's it. And at the cooperative level, the people will actually, you know, if it's whether it's an automated software, maybe there's a manager will say, I will attach this request to this autonomous device here, which will take care of the task on behalf of the farmer, will have access to the field boundaries uh, and to, to the product information that's needed for it, if relevant, and so on and so forth. So that's a model that could work uh, maybe for the kind of integration you had in mind. Finally, a last example to, to just see the flexibility of the model. Uh, you, you could imagine getting even more creative. Let's imagine that you want to set up uh, uh, a system on maybe very large field with collaborating tractors, so a so-called platoon. So those things would work together to work on the same task. Uh, you'd assume they might, in this particular example, they might even be able to exchange real-time information while they're drying it on the field. Uh, or, or things like that. Uh, but the point is, uh, you know, without having to do anything special for the equipment center, this is a scenario that we could handle out of the box today. All you would have to do if you were a software provider and you had this interesting use case of something like this you'd wanted to build, you would create, you would use the cloud to cloud API. You would create basically in your own environment, you would configure your platoon. So in saying, hey, maybe I have a, uh, I have a, uh, you know, a slurry tanker uh, with an uh, NIR sensor on it. Uh, uh, then I have uh, another tractor uh, with a, a spreader and a third one maybe even with uh, with a sprayer. Uh, I put all those and I put them, you know, I group them under one single designation, uh, which is what becomes what I can make visible in the equipment center. So to the equipment center, I would just have one what, virtual tractor. I mean, I don't know, it's just a reference, right? But which to you, you know in your environment that it represents three physical tractors. So whenever a task is sent to that by the equipment center, you have the opportunity, that's where your work comes in, to decide how do I divide the information between the different elements, between the different tractors and the platoon that I've configured uh, and, and take care of things. But for the equipment center, it's just one reference to whom I send a task set. I don't need to know how 
it does it. Uh, I don't even need to know whether it's a, whether it's a tractor or a drone for all, for all purposes. Via the cloud API, it can be anything that has an identifier and it's the target system that can decide on the physical connectivity, uh, whether it's a group of tractors, whether it's a drone, or whether it's anything else that uh, you can come up with. So that's just to, uh, I mean, that's something that wasn't in our initial design. It's actually, it matured uh, in the different interactions we had with open call winners because we we had uh, we had some of those people having some very interesting ideas, and uh, it turned out that uh, thanks to these interactions, we you know a concept emerged that's actually quite simple, but that has infinite possibilities. And that's the end of my presentation. So. Again, these things you've seen, you, so now they're recorded in the video in case you didn't write them down, the, some of the URLs, and, uh, and that's it. So I guess now we can pass on to the rest of any open-ended questions that you may have. Yes, so thanks, Marco, for that uh, uh, very detailed presentation. So what I see here is, uh, yeah, we have uh, comments from from Ed. Um, so it's it would work for the, the the use case in Kenya, and yes, we can surely discuss that in in uh, more detail. Um, feel free to contact us. Leave your con uh, your contact data here, um, so that we can schedule a meeting outside of this session and uh, go into detail. Cool. So thanks. Got your contact data and I can uh, approach everyone later. Um, do we have more questions? So the, we are here for the next 24 minutes. Any follow up to the project inside? Um, I mean, I don't want to to uh, talk about things which are not one hundred percent sure yet. But uh, yeah, we are we are working on this. Uh, what 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 I can say is that we will uh, run all the the infrastructure we have implemented so far. So the equipment center. The, the participant portal, the Atlas registry uh, uh, after the project. Uh, so we, we have a big interest in uh, continuing with this because we think this is this is the, the way it should be in the future with digital farming. And yeah, we have we have also formed a consortium of partners out of Atlas interested in uh, the continuation of that. Um, so all, all you have seen today and in the last webinar will be available in the future. So after in the future, I mean after July 31st when, when Atlas uh, is finished. And then follow up projects. Uh, yeah, we are working on it and of course we are always interested in, in joining other projects, in forming new consortia. So uh, if you have ideas here on, on the collaboration, if you think this is something uh, which should be continued, feel free to contact me. And will the project become fully open source or be rolled into a foundation DAO? Yeah, open source is something we have been discussing. 
Um, so what I mean, where we are now is in the state in, in which which form we will continue that, where we are also talking about which legal entity it will be, which continues Atlas, uh, a non-profit organization, uh, association, is uh, now a model we can uh, imagine and which uh, is, is quite uh, likely to do. But uh, it's not yet 100% decided in which way it will be continued. An open source, Meg, I'm, I'm not sure if you have an opinion here. It's I think it depends if, you know, if we're talking about Atlas, there, there are some components that uh, we would open source uh, with, I mean, where, where it's a no brainer. Uh, even things like uh, the, and the most important ones at the end of the day, such as the service registry, mm -hmm. it's something which is clearly on the table. Uh, when it comes to the equipment center, uh, that's still a different question because there's still uh, uh, a significant non-funded investment that came in there that uh, that needs to be recouped somehow. So we need to see if the open source model with uh, uh, you know, with, with a commercial side to it, does the trick or not? That's a decision to, to be made also. And I mean, what, what is already open source is what you, what you find on our public GitHub repositories. There is also source code for registry clients, for, for uh, Atlas service clients. So that is all there. Um, with the central components, yeah, the answer is we will see. Well said. The, the registry itself probably it's probably a no-brainer, uh, even though the significant amount of work came in there. But it, it's clearly the the heart of Atlas. Without that, there's nothing. And so, even if we don't continue, that will be there for sure. Uh, as I said, the on some other uh, non-apps mandatory components, the the question remains uh, remains on the table. Maybe one one comment here because that is also a, a, a quite common misconception I heard in the in the in the past. So if if you as an Atlas participant offer Atlas enabled services through Atlas, you can use the Atlas registry or you have to use it, uh, the participant portal, all these things. But even if the registry would be open source, it it does not mean that you have to give out your services open source or, or make your services for free. So this is this is not how, how Atlas works. But uh, I assume it's 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 clear to you as you have uh, listened to the webinar today, but it's a, it's a common misconception we, we uh, experience, especially in the beginning of the, the project. Um, so, but this is, uh, of course, not the case. So this is Atlas is uh, 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 business enabler in the end, and uh, our goal is to build up an ecosystem of of Atlas participants offering agricultural software systems, offering services, and uh, of course then uh, uh, earning money with these. So this is uh, important to understand. So we have some some uh, interesting comments in the chat here. Uh, uh, Xtech.org uh, Linux for for open source. Uh, the old tokenomics model uh, for uh, possible future iterations. So thanks for for these comments. We will have a look into into the details here and uh, maybe also approach you if we have further question. Um, then another question. Any cooperation or contract with GeoBox? 
at least not to my knowledge, not from Atlas, not from Fraunhofer, not sure if AgriCircle. No, it's also not from our not. side. To be honest, I'm not aware of them. So, uh, how, what, what do they do? Uh, what level of integration could there be with what we do in Atlas? So I see that there's quite a few different GeoBox references out there. I'm not sure which mm -hmm. one it is that you refer to. Okay, so there will be a, a comment coming in a few minutes. So the audio is uh, <laughs> not working, no problem here. So as I as I am I'm googling a little bit in the background, it's a uh, uh, geo information system. Yeah. So maybe now you can hear. Yes. Yes. Um, GeoBox. Yes, it's a. Uh, a lot about uh, geodata. Uh, in fact, uh, there are two things uh, that are implementing implemented in the GeoBox project. Uh, on the one hand, there is a server side where all the public uh, geodata is available uh, for farmers. And uh, on the other hand, there's uh, work being done on providing uh, a hoofbox uh, concept so uh, edge devices uh, which run at the farmer side and should uh, contain the data, uh, data storage, for example, and functionality, which is uh, pretty similar to uh, or integratable maybe with all the tasks uh, that are planned here. Uh, so it might be interesting to have these uh, interfaces uh, implemented there or, uh, I mean, it's interfaces, it's APIs. You can interconnect all these services if they are well defined. Um, so it might be might be interesting to uh, get into uh, yeah interconnectability there. Like they also have a small field atlas uh, thing, and they try to gather all information for a field, for example, in a kind of a field pass so that you get uh, can uh, combine everything that you have about the field and uh, push it forward to the next partner mm -hmm. and things like that. So it's, uh, what, I mean, I'm, I'm looking a little bit in the background here. Um, so, but this is, it's a, a German project in the end. Is it German or is it Swiss? Because I see a Geobox AG, which is in winter as well. So I was curious. Uh, it's uh, mostly German uh, in around uh, Palentina, done. Uh, and uh, but they have good contact to other um, federal mm -hmm. states, in Germany also. Yeah, it, it might for sure be interesting to uh, at least to uh, talk to them. So that the URL, the URL is, uh, if it's, I've Googled it a little bit. Um, maybe Martin, you have a, a, a better one than that. It's, it's in German, unfortunately. And uh, also the website is, if you click here on, on, on the menu, the, the project, you get, a, yeah, you get the 502, yeah. No, now it's, you have to do it multiple times, then it's might be working. That, I mean, that gives you an impression about digitalization in Germany. It's uh, it's not a topic of the webinar, but yeah, there is uh, of course still still room for improvement. If 
you maybe if you use the direct link, it can work. Yeah, looks looks interesting. So I will I will have a look into it in detail. Cool. But no, those are definitely interesting uh, discussions. I mean, uh, we we are I'm actually right after this meeting going to finalize also. Uh, having a meeting with uh, uh, one of the leading French FMIS uh, providers who has implemented the Atlas interface. Uh, and so, you know, at the end of the day, the good thing about Atlas is we're not a company. We don't have an agenda for making money out of that. We just want to make it easier for people to get to data in one common way as a general, uh, as a general philosophy. And so, uh, for instance, at AgriCircle, we've had APIs for a long while to uh, to information about fields and so on. Implementing the field data on AgriCircle is just uh, basically a a facade, an add-on service that piggybacks on our existing uh, on our existing API and that exposes the same data in an Atlas format. So that gives you know that kind of strategy makes it pretty easy for. Uh, a lot of software developers to to be Atlas compliant without having to completely change all their products. Uh, it can be a process. You can get on board that French company uh, was completely Atlas enabled. Uh, the, the whole process took uh, six weeks and I think it wasn't a high priority, uh, but after six weeks and that's a commercial FMIS provider, they are Atlas compliant. They have an Atlas field data they can consume uh, they can be clients to existing Atlas field data, and they can be a field data themselves. So the, the next step with them at some point will be to interface with the rest of the Atlas services, including the equipment center and things like that. So, Mac, do you see the chat or is it? Yeah, I see it. Yeah. So, I mean, I think we would be interested to discuss that in in detail, Ed. So, um, you, you have your you you left your contact data here, so I will I will uh, drop you a message afterwards, uh, email, and then uh, we uh, can schedule a meeting for the next the next days weeks. Yeah, because that level of integration is actually a fairly low hanging fruit. So it yeah. could be interesting to really have a, you know, a small committee group uh, meeting to, to figure out what it takes. But uh, I mean, typically looking at uh, a development effort that's counted in days uh, mm -hmm. or, or a couple of weeks, no more. Good. Yeah, also thanks uh, to Martin for these links. We will have a look into that. So that looks also very interesting. Uh, actually, I was not aware of it. So. Do we have. Yeah, why not? Always worth a visit. Uh, do we have more questions on the presentation on Atlas and the Equipment Center?
So. Very good. I guess we'll call it a day at this point. I would I would say so. So as we do not have any new emerging questions now. Yeah, Peter, if uh, if you want to implement uh, or if you want to connect to Atlas in Bulgaria, feel free to uh, I will drop you also a message afterwards. So if you have questions, we could, uh, of course, schedule a meeting. Let me give you some some insights. And I mean, that is that is, of course, uh, what everyone could do if there is something coming up uh, after this meeting, after you have digested what you have heard and seen. Um, feel free to contact us. We are always happy about feedback, about discussions, and uh, we always have time to discuss things in detail with you. What we will also do is we will uh, uh, put uh, share the recording of this webinar. Um, it will probably be done and linked on the website. Um, I need to check with my uh, colleagues who have organized all that, how we, how we make that available and approach you. Um, so, but if you have a look at the website, uh, then I think uh, uh, on our social media accounts, you will, will get notified about that for sure. Good. So then I would say thank you very much for your interest, your contributions and a very fruitful discussion. Uh, thanks to uh, Malku for that uh, great presentation here. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and uh, we will probably have some some more webinars uh, in the next weeks for uh, other topics we uh, have been working on in Atlas and where we have some uh, 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 probably helpful results for you. So thank you very much and have a nice weekend. Goodbye. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.